Hello and welcome to a new uh, YouTube podcast series, Dinesh Guarda, Cities ABC Open Business Council. Uh, once again, here we are to keep another journey of discussing personalities, work and innovation and what is happening around the technology, about ideas and about changing the world. And uh, I welcome to our series again a personality that I admire a lot that has been actually doing a, an interesting splash in the NFT world, but as well in the blockchain world and a lot of other things. So Andrea Bonacetto, which is actually um, the second recurrent year, and I hope there'll be more. Um, and I think we're going to be talking today not so much about this profile. You can see that in our previous interview that is available on my YouTube channel. And as well, you can find it uh, in terms of uh, the, the things we did both in Open Business Council City, you see where we have a bio and information about him. But today we're going to be talking about his new work that is live uh, in the... Um, in w, w1 curates you can find it on instagram as well information and uh, that is about the ab infinite one which i think i'm very excited to talk and is a great work and as well talking about the innovation that andreas uh, andrea has been do doing in the in the world of nfts and all the things related so welcome again andrea wonderful to have you here thank you for having me Dennis. it's great to be back Perfect. So, so I think, well, what I would like to start here is, so since last uh, interview, which was less than a year ago, the NFT ecosystem has been exploding, both in terms of innovation, both in terms of numbers, which is crazy right now. I think it passed around 40 to $50 billion and it keeps growing. There was as well the crash of crypto. There was a lot of things happening, but at the same time, actually still, I would say quite stable there in mind everything happening in the world. So because it's, uh, what is happening in the world is a bit more dramatic than what is happening in the crypto and the NFT industry. So first of all, tell us about your new project and tell us what you've been doing since the last time we spoke, because I, I would like to start by that. Yeah, sure. Um, so last time we spoke, as you said, you know, was a year ago. That uh, doesn't sound like a long time ago, but actually in NFT terms, it's like we spoke, I don't know, 100 years ago, <laughs> since so much has changed since then. And what I've been doing, uh, I mean, I've been uh, working a lot in the space in uh, several areas. Um, I've been, you know, releasing my NFTs mostly through Nifty Gateway over the past year. And now the trajectory I'm taking uh, is to go for more aspirational and hard off projects. Uh, and AB Infinite One, as you mentioned, is uh, the first example of that. Um, what is AB Infinite One? It's basically a, a very large abstract work which represents a snapshot of my life. And um, it's a programmable uh, NFT and upgradable NFT. What does it mean? It means that uh, people that are using the hashtag AB Infinite One on social networks actually will be able to alter the piece. So it basically change, is changing based on, the, on people interacting with the piece. Uh, on social networks and we designed like a software to being able to do that it's just that i always try to explain it in a simple way but it's not that uh, that simple so i want to avoid technicalities but in a nutshell is uh, use the hashtag ab infinite one on twitter and instagram you go on the website uh, you basically uh, share your handles there and then whatever you share is embedded into the piece in an abstract fashion so I, I want to, I think probably I'll do one thing in my team that can actually do, but I want to share the screen um, with, uh, with people. I think I would like to do it in real time because I think a lot of these things, what I've been finding is that, um, I think I'm sharing the screen right now. And one of the things I've been finding when you look at these things is definitely there's a, a big uh, um, kind of complexity about the, the technology part of this and even to you so I, I think i would like for you to present this while i'm sharing and then the team can actually improve the the video but just if you could actually give us a bit of an overview now that i'm sharing and i can go a bit for this because i think it's really important for people listening to yeah. us because even people very advanced on this they have all of the most uh, kind of um, pertinent questions that i think it's important that we tackle this as technologists and as well creators so as you see, first of all, there are two components on the W1 Curates installation in Oxford Circus uh, in London. So the first is AB Infinite One, which is this piece that you see now, you know, the abstract work, which as I explained, has uh, a generative component. And then there are the portraits that you see right now. And uh, I've been doing, you know, mostly abstract landscapes and portraits. So I decided to represent both of them. 
And the way the portraits are part of the work is that if you actually take one of the portraits, you use the hashtag ABInfinite1 on Twitter or Instagram, the software we designed actually takes that image and embeds the image into the piece. And um, if you actually then go and examine the piece, you'll see that uh, there are some sections that are abstract that I actually drew, and is most of it. And then some parts that are AI generated, which you can identify because they just have a bit of different uh, color and feeling, but they still uh, are in line with the color palette of the piece. And um, and yeah, I mean, like, like this one, you see like this pyramid, like this reversed pyramid, that's actually AI generated. Um, and yeah, I mean, I could go through the piece like step by step and tell you why I did what I did, because this time it was more uh, of trying to really abstract uh, many things that I think and put them into, you know, a visual representations through this piece. Um, but yeah, you we will need to Yeah, no, I would like uh, if you could go a bit more through the, the, the both the technology and the participation collaboration, because I think it's particularly important because when you talk about uh, NFTs and all the innovation around NFTs, I think 90% of the talk is about how much is worth the NFT, how much someone is cashing out. And people forget how the artists are doing it and the innovation that is coming out of this. And I think it's, I like to make a briefing on that because I think we have enough speculation and enough uh, uh, speculation and a lot of craziness around this, but that's a great things happening. And normally we tend actually to speak about the bad ones. And I think what you're doing is amazing because you touch both the creative side the technology side and as well the collaborative side which is amazing and i think uh, it's quite unique as well because it has as well right now we we participating par par partnershiping with very um interesting organizations and some of them quite big so i would like to touch if you could a bit push these different layers because i think it's important for our audience and for people listening to us yes so uh as you can see here uh what i didn't manage to explain properly at the, be at the very beginning uh, in an easy way, how to participate uh, into the piece. So the first step is you accept the terms and conditions that you click on that link. And it's basically about, you know, you sharing your Instagram and Twitter handles and giving the consent to actually use those images into the piece in an abstract way. And then you use the hashtag whenever you share content on social networks and the hashtag is abinfinite one as you can see there. And then to give an example, if that image that you see on the top left uh, is one of the generated images. So, you know, whenever you share stuff on social network, it's not that uh, you're going to see your face suddenly popping up on the piece. It's going to be completely distorted. You won't be able to tell what is it. But uh, um, actually, you know, there is a component uh, of each person that interacted with the piece into the piece. And from a technological standpoint, uh, this piece is minted on the Agron blockchain. Um, as an upgradable NFT using uh, the latest NFT standard called Arch19, which allows you to do upgradable NFTs. But what does that mean? It means that uh, you meet the NFT and then uh, you can, uh, it's like an NFT nested within another NFT. You can upgrade it. Like there is a transaction on the blockchain uh, pretty much on a daily basis now for that piece that actually upgrades the piece. And um, if you go actually and see the piece right now, you'll see that uh, it's different from the one that, uh, for instance, from the snapshots that you see there, because some sections are different, like the poem. There is also one thing I forgot to mention, a self-generated poem as part of the piece. So the one that you see there in yellow on the top left, I wrote it to start with, but this is going to then change based on whatever people say on social networks using the hashtag. And uh, if you go and you go check it now, you'll see it's different. So if you actually go and uh, you go on the main page and you click view artwork, you'll be able to see that uh, some sections are different. And um, it might take you some time to do the art to load it just because uh, it's uh, you know, a big file at the beginning. So depending on, uh, okay, on your internet connection. And then you see, you can basically navigate through the piece and uh, you will see that some sections are different. For instance, if you keep going, yeah, that, you see? This is actually the first time I see it. This, uh, this is new. That cube is actually new. That is new as well. That part also changed. And uh, if you go on the other side, on the, um, 
on the point part, which is you need to just scroll on the other part. You'll see that even the poem uh, as uh, is different; it is constantly updating. And this artwork is quite big; is uh, 63 meters times 3 meters at its full scale. But the good thing is that because of vectorial artwork, um, I can uh, increase it or decrease it as much as I want, as long as I maintain the dimensions fixed, uh, and it will never lose uh, definition. So. The beauty of this is that it can really be displayed enormous in public places, like I'm doing at uh, W1, W1 Curates in Oxford Street in London. Yeah, that's uh, that's first of all congratulations. This is beautiful and very powerful as well because it's it's completely, I would say, art 3.0, like like we say, we have 3.0. So so just for me to understand, so Andre, in terms of. Uh, you mentioned the way the blockchain there's a component of ai and there's a component of collaboration um so can you explain this process because i think these three things are, is something that normally this happens a lot in the creative world if you look at the works of bjork or even um, a lot of very big artists worldwide that's what they do but when it comes to using technology and make this as well in nfts and selling it as well and having this there's a completely new kind of would say um artistic approach to this but that's as well a technological and then and then and the business approach to this so i would like to touch these three levels so um from a technological first standpoint first um this is all updating on chain so it would have been impossible to do something like this on ethereum just because uh, you know every time that you up upgrade the artwork is a transaction on the blockchain so it would be very expensive uh, from a you know gas fee standpoint uh, and also would have you know every time uh, a certain you know environmental impact that on Algorand uh, it's not the case because a proof of stake blockchain and uh, you know sending transactions cost a fraction of a cent so that's very um, efficient uh, from an energy standpoint and from also a speed transaction standpoint um, and this was you know the main reason of why Algorand really was used for uh, for this project and as I mentioned you know we use the latest uh, NFT protocol. We designed uh, AI specifically for that, that is able to understand the color palette of the piece. So then uh, whenever we embed uh, the generative part into the artwork, uh, it's done in a way that is actually not disturbing the color palette of the piece. And it makes sense from a color scheme standpoint. Then from an artist standpoint, you know, what does this piece represent? It represents a bit of my story. The story of my life by some extent there are many references to many people and uh, other artists as well that have inspired me throughout my life there are references to Dostoevsky uh, the Karamazov brother is one of the books that probably influenced me the most so there is a reference to Thomas Mann uh, Ezra Pound uh, um, Vasily Nizinsky who is a Russian dancer that wrote a diary uh, which was very let's say yeah, I mean, peculiar, I would say. And uh, the poem also is uh, a reference, I would say, to the Ulysses of Joyce, because the dimension is still uh, a stream of conscious, but uh, is a stream of conscious that in this time uh, is dynamic and is uh, projected into the future, meaning that uh, the words that you're going to see there, uh, they probably won't make sense to you from a grammatical standpoint, but they are the result of uh, people interacting with the piece. And... Uh, then there are many, many other hidden layers and uh, things into the piece, but uh, it's mostly me trying to summarize what I think is important uh, about what I do in a visual uh, representation. And that process, of course, is important to include uh, other people that had an impact on my life uh, as an individual and also now have an impact on the artwork. No, it's amazing. And I think uh, it's really beautiful as well the way you put it in the way you're taking it forward as a creator, but as well as a technologist and as a, a, a business personality. So how are you commercializing this? Because this, I would like to touch that because I think one of the questions I have, even from very high profile personalities is, okay, how would you get into NFTs? How do you make this work? And people forget that it's not just putting an NFT in OpenSea or in NFTGet yeah. away and suddenly start selling. Yeah. So this is uh, the way it's going to work for this piece is that this piece is going to go around the world on a global tour, like uh, now is in Oxford Circus, uh, 
is going to go at a major museum in Italy, in Milan, called Museo della Permanente, as part of an exhibition called DART 221. We'll go to China, it will go to Turkey, uh, it will be part of the Decentral Art Pavilion of the Venice Biennale. It might go as well uh, uh, in New York, uh, Times Square. We are still you know, seeing about that. Uh, and then it will come back to London at the end of the tour, probably by the end of the year, I would say. Um, and there it will be exhibited again in Oxford Circus on uh, an internal screen this time that is exactly 63 meters times 3 meters, so you can really appreciate it all. And at that point it will be sold as a one-on-one -on -one at a major auction house. Uh, fantastic. So, so let me ask one question on this part, because this is a very interesting, um, of course you are not a conventional artist because you have the investment background, you have the technology background. But let's say for artists listening to us, because I know that a lot of big artists are trying to do and come back to this. Um, how would you suggest, and I think probably from your example, because you had the work that you did with Sophia, that was more conventional in the sense that you put it to, for not conventional, it was actually not conventional at all, but at least mm -hmm. it was conventional in the sense it was sold as an NFT at least. Here it's much more dynamic and much more innovative. So I would like to see how you, how you can actually explain the two dynamics around this, because of course here you are selling this as an art piece and as a, a much more a, a profile artist whereas most of the other things are being of course they are still art pieces but they are putting in a in, it's like you put in a gallery but this the gallery is the nft and this is the platform where you're selling yeah. it no as i, I like just is getting, a, yeah. yeah so first i want to say one thing because it's true that uh, i'm involved in the blockchain and nft space on different front but uh what I'm trying really to do with myself is an, as an individual is to break this misconception, in my opinion, that people are unidimensional. For me, you know, I'm just myself and I try to, I'm very curious and uh, I explore new things in a very uh, naive way many times. And, uh, you know, I think art in the end is being yourself, you know, being free. So I would consider myself doing that 24-7 uh, or at least trying to do that uh, 24-7 uh, of my life. So this is very important because I think uh, we should go beyond, you know, saying, okay, you're an investor, you're an entrepreneur, you're an artist, you know. I think they're very restrictive as definitions. So this is the first point. Then um, on uh, me selling the piece in a different way compared to the past, uh, it's true and not true at the same time uh, in the sense that it's still sold as an NFT. This, this is still like one NFT that upgrades, but still is one NFT. But you are right, you are very right that uh, there is a clear, uh, um, let's say, there are clearly two phases in my process, in my trajectory as an artist, which is uh, before and after this piece. You know, before uh, it's true that I was relying uh, mostly on uh, Nifty Gateway, which I'm very grateful to Nifty Gateway and I will continue also, you know, at some point uh, do releases there. It's not that I won't do releases on Nifty Gateway anymore. But uh, I will be focusing a lot more on uh, ad hoc aspirational NFT projects that really shows what you can do with NFTs as a medium. And, um, and yeah, for that, sometimes there are no platforms available. Like what I'm doing now, there is no platform that can support it at the moment. So I need to do it completely ad hoc. Um, and you know, for generative art and programmable art, it's very important, in my opinion, to do on-chain activities and to really show um, history of what's happening on the blockchain. And in this case, everything is on-chain. So if you go and you go on the Argo Explorer link, you can see all the different uh, transactions that upgrade the artwork and you can click as well and go to the IPFS link that is pointing into the image of that specific upgrade. So it's a very... It, it, it really, you know, it's projected into the future as a piece, but it's also not forgetting the past. And uh, I like the fact that uh, it's done uh, from a technical standpoint in a very profound way, even on that front. So I think, you know, it has the both elements, something very personal to me that I think is full of meaning artistically and also technologically, I would say is at the same level. And uh, yeah, I think it, uh, I'm quite happy with, uh, with the response so far. No, but I think one thing that uh, from what you're saying, of course, I hear you on this very powerful what you're doing. I think we, you and me are still in different levels of developing compared with most of the people, because I think uh, 
even artists that have been on this for a long time, I have a lot of reservations, a lot of questions, museums, inclusive and galleries. So I want to touch two things. So the first one, let's start with that one is, is the, the royalties. So for instance, uh, you, you, of course, you did the, something quite innovative to say less. I think it was probably the first in the world that you created an art piece with a robot. And the robot, of course, is owned by, by a company. So I would like to touch the, the royalties of NFTs. So that, that is, I would like to touch these different iterations because the first one was you collaborating with a robot that is owned by Hanson yeah. Robotics. The second right now is you selling your pieces in the NFTs and in that NFT gateway and platforms for NFTs. And the third one is a piece like this, which has a much different conception because you are aiming to sell one piece and it's more like conventional hard sale, just using the technology. Yeah. So can you, can you, and I think, I'm sure that you learn a lot during the process, because of course you're talking about the NFT revolution is just one year old, at least in terms of art, as we see it before that it happened for, it's been going for like uh, at least seven or eight years, but in the, in the way we have it is a completely different ball game. So if you could tell a bit, the, at least some of your experience and my ideas about the NFT royalties. So the issue with NFT royalties is that it's difficult to have portability of royalties among different platforms and different blockchains, particularly. So at the moment, you mostly have them like uh, nested into a specific platform, meaning on Nifty Gateway, if you do secondary sales, they'll pay your royalties. The same you know, will happen on other platform, but uh, to have them streamlined among uh, all the platforms and even all the blockchains, it's still not possible. But it's something that um, hopefully at some point, you know, you have some uh, technological improvements that would uh, at least make it a bit easier. Um, but I mean, compared to the traditional world, it's something where uh, it's definitely, you know, more uh, rewarding and um, efficient. But uh, it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. And uh, as you said, it's more relevant uh, for very high amount uh, of means, you know, if you do a collection with like 10,000 NFTs, like of course the secondary sales element is very important. Uh, in my case, uh, I don't have that many NFTs out there and uh, my trajectory is really to focus uh, a lot also on uh, scarcity, which I think is very, very important. And uh, in the NFT space, people that understand that particularly artists will, uh, um, I think will, you know, you, you'll see the long-term effect on that because, you know, now we, we can then probably touch about the market, but uh, there are many things also that I personally think that uh, should improve and change. But uh, yeah, on the royalty part, as I said, you know, it's mostly platform specific and, uh, and yeah, but uh, on, on that, if you're operating that specific platform is very efficient. Yeah. So another talk, another question I have for you, and is more on the industry side, but I would like for you to touch is that one of the the challenges that there's a lot of studies saying that around seventy to eighty percent of the NFTs are fake, or people pretending to be other people, and actually, especially in in, in OpenSea, they actually ad admitted that. So yes. uh, I know that Nifty Gateway is much more um, is much more mature and much more the way they work is a bit more uh, um, sophisticated and super rare, probably even more in different areas but like you said each platform has their own ecosystems and this reminds a bit the beginning of the internet that you have to go by platform until you be able to scale and do the e-commerce and so forth until you get the the operability between the different platforms so what what's your views on this and and especially how can we nail this because it's a big thing that of course for the nfts to become products that can be massive consumption because uh, um, my studies in terms of numbers, and I think it's interesting numbers for the audience, is that at the moment, so the, the market cap uh, of NFTs as we speak is around $19 billion. The volume for the last seven days is around $446 million. And uh, the number of traders is um, around, on daily basis, more or less, in the last seven days, around 119,000. And the holders of NFTs is 2 million. So 2.2 million. So it's still very small numbers if you look at mainstream. And of course, if you look at all the money, so that means if you look at, the, let's say, between, we're talking about uh, uh, $19 billion in the last recent uh, months. But if you look at all the transactions, we're talking about between $47 billion in 2022, uh, as of May 1st. And this is data from chain analysis as and from global uh, NFT go. So I, I would like to hear your views, especially on this part of um, the uh, the transparency around the market, and as well how we can actually touch 
and somehow make the industry better for artists and creators like you and other people. And of course, you are a special creator because you are a quite uh, wealthy personality in terms of being able to touch a lot of different areas that very few people can do it. Well, I think uh, um, the NFT space should evolve in uh, a sustainable way. Um, of course, you know, last year was crazy because there was a lot of money involved and uh, that attracts good actors, but also mostly bad actors. And I think that we are starting to see uh, what my friend Pablo always called this, calls the decoupling, you know, basically from an artist standpoint, you know, the ones that are actually going to the next level and are focusing on the long term uh, to really be honest and explore in an aspirational way, you know, their art and others that uh, they're mostly focusing on money grabbing, you know, in the short term by inflating the supply and um, yeah, squeezing, you know, as much as possible uh, the group of collectors. I think that won't age well. And uh, I think then even in the PFP space, uh, you have the same dynamic, you know, you basically have uh, very strong communities like Board Apes, uh, Clone X uh, and others that I think uh, will remain and uh, will, uh, you know, become very, very relevant uh, even more than now in the future. But the majority of it, you know, the majority of those projects will actually disappear because they don't really have any, you know, like serious and uh, profound uh, community hedge against, you know, everyone else. Um, and so we witness that, you know, I think we'll, um, the space will mature through cycles as uh, also the blockchain, you know, has done and Bitcoin has done. And we just need to be ready for that. We need to be cautious. But uh, what I feel is that as long as um, we all push for projects that are perfectly executed, uh, artists that are honest and they have content to deliver and they really focus on uh, the art and uh, the quality of what they're doing and they use NFTs as a mean, as not a demand, then we're going to do well. And, we're, and people doing that are pushing the space uh, uh, in the right direction. And particularly now during the bear market, uh, it's very interesting to see who is actually still around and still doing things, right? Because it's very easy to do things and show up during, you know, bull market where so much is happening. But it's during the bear market, I think, when you see who the real people building are. And uh, on a personal level, also, I feel that uh, for NFT artists, we should also stop talking about NFTs. It's really the time uh, to bridge this gap with the traditional world. Um, and take the good things that the traditional world also in the art space has done from a quality and uh, aspirational standpoint uh, and bring them into the space. So I'm hoping that uh, these two worlds will merge and I'm trying, you know, to push for that from happening uh, as an artist, but as well, you know, as uh, an entrepreneur in the space, you know, with several initiatives that uh, I'm working on. And uh, because what I care about in the end is that we are moving uh, as a society to a phase where, uh, you know, art is important. Uh, the key element is to be yourself and uh, we leverage other technological innovations like AI, automation and everything to free up ourselves from a context where we need to sell uh, our time for money and then, you know, do works that do not represent us. So for me, it's all part of a major uh, paradigm shift and, uh, I feel that my personality that is covering like uh, so many different areas is uh, somehow by chance almost uh, uh, aligned with uh, with this new trend. Yeah, I completely am with you. But uh, but the one thing I learned is that these things happen by people pushing the boundaries and people um, as well democratizing or at least educating and creating ecosystems. So one of the, the questions I have for you is that you're building an ecosystem. And I think what makes a great artist, especially in the, this world of digital and increasing more sophisticated technology is building a community. And in the end of the day, it's not different from an artist in the offline world that would have to create a relationship with the gallery, with his, event, with his fans, or at least the people that like his work and as well with his collectors. So I think here, and you mentioned the board of the apes that actually with the ape coin created a massive ecosystem of billions of dollars that I think is definitely the most uh, ambitious one, but you have the crypto, uh, the, the crypto catties, kitties and so forth. So how do you, well, how do you see this part of building a community online? Because a, a lot of these things, if you look, especially with the board of the apes is a great example is really 
they cra- actually two weeks ago they they crash ethereum which is kind of uh, amazing because they they actually right now started with the with the kind of the drawings and and the animated paintings and they became an icon for the crypto investors crypto uh, and crypto community i would like to see especially if, how you tackle the community and if there's any uh, things that you learned with your experience in the last one year uh, more active on this and even uh, other things that you might want to share with our audience and and, and talk yeah that's a um, simple question that you asked but uh, requires like a quite complicated and uh, difficult also answer because first of all uh, there are still many possible avenues uh, from a community standpoint i think you know board Ape, of course they did uh yuga labs like an amazing work in building a community uh, i'm personally always a bit skeptical when uh, you know the, i understand you know the the token element uh, and what they want to do in creating like a community around it but uh, i don't know like i personally let's say connect more with uh, things like uh, clone x that has been you know recently backed also and acquired by nike where they are doing you know things in the real world uh, to actually uh, connect nfts also to real goods and uh, basically nurture the community through that i don't know if uh, I think is is a bit. Uh, we should be careful. Like I'm really. I mean, I hope of course that uh, ApeCoin does well, and uh, you know, because the community is amazing. But I'm just not sure about uh, this inflation of uh, tokens. You know, having tokens for uh, every single thing. Uh, I don't think that we're going towards a society where uh, we're gonna require you know so many coins. Uh, you probably require really a handful of them, and then for the rest you need just you know the blockchain in the background. Uh, to do certain activities, but I would be, it's a bold move for sure, you know, from them, you know, it's a bold move and we need to see how it, uh, how it goes in the, in the long term, you know, because these are products that they start now, but then we need to see in 10 years time how they actually um, evolve. So on that, uh, I start by always, you know, when uh, there are new token dimensions for engaging with communities, I'm a bit like, okay, I. I'm not, I don't immediately like jump on it, but um, I'm curious and uh, I, you know, I'm here also to learn myself. But in general, what I recognize is that uh, collectibles uh, have shown uh, the potential of, of communities online and how much people care about uh, being part of a certain group publicly on the internet. And then uh, now it's on all of us to understand uh, how to actually bring that to the next level in a sustainable way. I completely subscribe with you. And I, I think it's a big risk as well. The idea, of course, I, I've been involved in creating tokens. I am, I'm part of the, <laughs> I, where am I to, to judge anyone? But it's not about that. It's about, of course, if you create a token, you need really to have a name of creating a community and create some kind of utility system or at least some security, whatever, depend, depends I mean, on the token. I mean, I've been uh, like, uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. Like, I'm also, I think that tokens are very relevant and uh, I'm also, you know, involved in uh, projects that they do have uh, tokens. But I'm just saying that uh, it's always important to stress test these things a lot. And uh, as a rule of thumb, you should never, in my opinion, have a token if it's not... Uh, strictly necessary for the group you know that you want to engage with or for the solution that you want to create so it's important to have that mindset because the problem is uh, we talk is that it created that uh, um, conception of free money you know for everyone like boom you do a token you create your own economy and suddenly people uh, they get rich very very quick without having really delivered much and normally in traditional companies it's not like that right if you want to exit your startup outside of blockchain you need to either sell it, go public, you need to actually deliver a lot. Whereas uh, the issue that many times I see in uh, the blockchain space is that uh, you can become very wealthy by having like a token-based project, uh, but not having delivered anything actually, you know? And then you are uh, selling it to someone at a certain point, you know, might get burned. So on that, uh, we should be careful because then these things, they don't uh, age well and they damage the, the, the whole community. Um, so this is like a generic comment. It's not like pointed at uh, any specific project. No, no, I completely subscribe with you. And I think it's really a big risk because we've been actually 
um, I think if you look at blockchain technology and everything related with uh, with innovation of crypto was created actually to create innovative systems initially to to power uh, all the different things and it became a bit of a another speculative way and of course there's nothing wrong with speculative as long as you do it within the rules and you don't create more damage but well i think that we i think we all should agree and i think what is important is really it's important to repeat for people listening to us if you want a quick win and if you want to make a quick buck please don't don't try to do these things because there's always a price you pay there's no short throats like they say so so i think in terms of uh, coming back to the way you're working right now so i think we are in a crossroad between the that I would say that the stage two of blockchain 2.0 and the web 3.0. And at the moment, for instance, your, your last work is a bit of a metaverse that you're creating because it has a huge component of interactivity, an immersive experience digital, and a collaborative experience. Of course, the definition of metaverse is very big and it can go in multiple directions according to what you want. But definitely, for me, metaverse is not about meta. I'm talking to Facebook. It's much more about immersive experiences. I will say metaversive experiences. So what are your views on the concept of metaverse and the web 3.0, which partly what you're doing is part of that? Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, very bullish and interested into the metaverse. Uh, first, uh, one step back. The majority of things that are labeled as metaverses are not metaverses. This is a very important point, you know, because there's a difference between uh, uh, VR experience of like a digital room and stuff and a metaverse, which is actually what I just mentioned, but on the blockchain where everyone can actually go interact with everything, uh, even multiple people, you know, can go and interact. So I see the metaverse as a, a parallel world where I can go and I can have my stuff and I can speak with people and I can interact with things. And uh, I mean, the potential for that is, uh, it's crazy. You know, our life is mostly digital at the moment and we don't have that concept at scale yet. It will look counterintuitive for people like in 20, 30 years from now, they'll be like, oh, okay, how could they actually, you know, do it without it? And I feel that uh, the metaverse would be a place where uh, people can um, get many opportunities that they couldn't get before. And I hope that then they still go into the real world to actually fully um, explore those opportunities but uh, we are still at the very very early stage still and uh, you know most of the main metaverses right now they are very basic uh, graphics uh, and uh, they look like old uh, games and it's surprising that even you know people are uh, hanging around in them sometimes and now we are going to see the wave of uh, you know meta uh, happy games and large corporates entering the space i hope the maintain like a decentralized and transparent ethos as uh, you know the blockchain community requires um but i don't know like uh, i think they would be for sure better from uh, a graphic standpoint and a user experience standpoint uh, but then we need to see you know if uh, the current community actually will uh, embrace them or not i think it's important to I, i'm doing again the example of clonex you know I, I really hope that uh, big brands, they have uh, a sort of a continuity approach with Web3 and they don't want to superimpose their, uh, uh, their, their brands and their you know, status uh, into you know, a new community like, uh, like the Web3 community, but uh, they actually understand from it, like I think Nike did with CloneX and then they morph based on it. I think that's a smart approach. So. If that happens, um, maybe you know we could we could have even a less divisive uh, um, integration, you know, between these large corporates and uh, the metaverse and blockchain space uh, in general. But in a nutshell, uh, I'm very bullish on the metaverse. I think you know it will be enormous, uh, and uh, all the activities that you do in the real world, uh, you'll be able to do them as well in the metaverse. Yeah, so it's just for people listening to us and just to make a bit of context because me and Andrea were a bit fast velocity. So I think just uh, for people that never heard about this, so um, Clonex is, a, is a, 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 an NFT ecosystem that was created by a company called RTFKT and uh, it was acquired by Nike on December 13, 2021 and of course Spike, um, all the NFTs. But what they do is precisely creating virtual sneakers with very creative uh, um, environments for the sneaky community which is a very dynamic community worldwide 
So just giving a bit of context. So, so coming yeah, back to the metaverse you. definition and the, and the definition as well, how you look at uh, this, because I'm seeing more, uh, and I'm talking on my own, okay? This is my definition of, met of metaverse is becoming more about, I would say a kind of a second iteration of social networks, but where the difference is that in social networks, and I think this is probably a second question, is that in social networks, there's, nine, there's a 99% rule. So 1% is that people create content, the other 99% just go passive and interact or retweet or invest or so forth. Whereas of course the metaverse is where hopefully at least more than more than 1% are much more active and interactive. And as well, they have to use much more kind of a, a engaging and immersive ecosystems digital. So this is more my experience. And, and as well, actually I'm working on that. So I'm a bit guilty that I, I, I'm actually leading this, but how do you see this? Because in the end of the day, let's look at your work and the work of a lot of artists. Um, for instance, what you're doing partly with the Infinity, uh, AB Infinite One, is partly already uh, an interaction um, with the other people that can interact sure. with the, yeah. So I, I, I know that it's not, a, um, we cannot consider it because it's an artist driven platform or a concept that has interaction with people. So it's different because it, of course, it matters. Mm -hmm. But I would like to touch this because there's a really a lot of myth. For instance, I had a discussion with a high personality in the gaming world that they were saying, oh, Metaverse is only VR. And, and for instance, I am not really into VR at all because I think VR has so much issues. I, I think it's great for some experience, but I hope that the Metaverse is not Ready Player One <laughs> that some people might think about it. So I would like to touch this because I think really there's a lot of myth and, uh, and actually a lot of... Um, I would say a lot of prejudice and as well preconcept ideas. And the same, like you said about the NFTs, because people think that uh, the NFTs will be the miracle that will save all the artists. No, it's it's much more about doing work in long term. Yeah, exactly. At a medium, like uh, if you if the concept you want to deliver is bad, you just deliver a bad concept to more people in a more efficient way, but still it will be bad. And the metaverse uh, point, uh, I. Um, I agree with you in the sense that probably still also a semantic uh, situation, meaning that, uh, yeah, the way I defined it probably is different from the way you would define it, and that's fine. We are still, you know, settling on uh, what the metaverse actually is because it's still very, very early. It's a prehistoric phase for that technology, and uh, we need to see again. But uh, you're very right that... Um, my piece, at the very least, has some metaverse dynamics. It smells like metaverse, at the very least. Um, and I like what you said about social network. It's true that uh, in the metaverse, you know, you need to be active. I mean, you go there to discover things, right? You wouldn't go there to, to sleep. Maybe, I don't know, at some point you can even sleep in the metaverse, but uh, people, I think, would still be required to sleep in the real life as well. So. Um, but uh, yeah, it has that, uh, that, like the thing that I like about the metaverse is that it does have the dimension of you opening up to the rest of the world. Uh, and whenever, you know, I met people there, they were always open, like to talk and to share ideas. And uh, you can finally have uh, groups that connect based on certain interests and actually then meet, talk in a way that is more of uh, than you know doing a phone call or a video call um and then you know they can even meet in person um so is um is a very interesting um, is a very interesting uh, field and uh, as an artist as well it's something that i will definitely explore more and more so i think uh, you somehow spoiled a bit the future of what i'm doing in the sense that uh, you already saw the hint of a metaverse kind of direction uh, in the art that I'm making, uh, which is true. No, and I think it's really, uh, I th well, I, I think we, we talk the same language, but it's really, uh, I think this is opening so much new uh, um, roads for everyone. But at the same time, I think you touch one key element and we're passing almost one hour, so I'll be conscious of your time. But, but I think one, one important thing for me is really that what you touch in the sense of the responsibility to create value is the key element. And I think that is what I love about your work and, and people like you and us, what you're trying to do is, if you don't create value, okay, it's really, you create just another issue and we have enough issues in the world. So, so I think uh, to finish on a more positive level, so I, I would like to hear, first of all, you touched right now, of course, that you are going probably on these directions, but uh, 
what are like the next steps so you mentioned about the the ab infinite one but as well of course right now you created the brand you created your own nfts you create as well a new role as as an artist and as as well a, an interactive artist but you are still an entrepreneur and as well an investor so can you tell us how you're going to continue because i think it's quite interesting for us i think if you look at history and i'll, I'll use a, a metaphor that is quite interesting if you look at people like tiziano and of course uh, you are Italian, so you can go for a lot of artists in Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. Even, even for instance, uh, uh, of course, I love they, uh, I love all the the Renaissance artists. But we can go in history. All of these artists created an entire industry around them, uh, from from Leonardo da Vinci to Michelangelo to, of course, uh, uh, actually we have the exhibition right now in National Gallery, of course, uh, of the 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 one that died early. So I think we have all these amazing things, but. Uh, in the end of the day, there's, these people are like 0, 0, 0. 0.001%. Okay, then the rest of the people normally follow the trends and try to do this. And I think the premise, uh, and for instance, you can go to, there was a couple of artists in history that created like substantial business around them. But in general, most of the artists, unfortunately, and I think the studies say that there's around 3 million artists around the world. Um, and, uh, and most of these people are on the verge of poverty. Actually, this was something that actually Nesta here in the UK um, confirmed in one of the interviews I mentioned as well. So there's a lot of challenge here. And the thing definitely is that you and me are privileged people because we have different tools we can play okay. around different people. But, but I think I would like to touch both your personal journey, which is wonderful what you're trying to do, but as well how you see the rest of the context. Because I think for me, this has to be a bridge because if you don't create a better empowered world, we might have a distance. That's a very good point. Ready That's a very good point. And I, I'm very happy you asked that question because it allows me to expand on uh, something I care a lot about. So the first dimension, as you said, is about me. You know, what do I do? Nothing more than trying to be myself. That's it. That's what I'm trying to be brutally honest uh, with who I am. And uh, that's the, the, the directions that I took in my life that the result of that. Then there are several components, as you mentioned, because uh, I'm an investor uh, and uh, I'm an entrepreneur as well. I launched uh, an NFT cultural institution called Aurist, uh, which is, you know, again, you know, very aspirational as I'm trying to do as an artist as well, as an individual, you know, to create art. But in the end, uh, those are just different faces of the same coin. You see what I mean? Like... Uh, there is this misconception that I really don't like, that uh, people should be, I don't know, you, you want to do this and you should work like uh, 24 hours per day on that one thing and then uh, you will be the best and everything. It doesn't work like that. To have like very high profile and high quality effort into something, you won't be able to do it for 24 hours a day. If, if they tell you, tell me the thing that you like the most in your life, and do it 24 hours a day, you will start hating that thing. So I think we should really move from that hyper-competitive dimension of people like all fighting with each other because they're very insecure and they want to look that they're the best in front of their parents or their friends. It's not the point. If you are still there, you should you know, change uh, uh, direction. That, so this is just to contextualize you know what i'm doing me is just really a very honest effort that i don't want to be labeled in a way or another I'm, I'm being myself and being myself involves like being an artist because for me the most important thing is to be free and i think you know freedom is the highest ideal for uh, for, for human beings and uh, i'm a very curious person so it makes sense to explore many things and then they come all together because i wouldn't be able to do a b infinite one if i didn't have uh, a very profound and deep understanding of the blockchain as an investor as well, you know, as someone that looked at many, many projects, looked at NFT in details. And uh, as well, you know, uh, with all the people that I met through Auris, which is this uh, aspirational cultural institution that I created together with uh, Pablo Rodriguez Freire and Jimena Caminos, I wouldn't have probably the, you know, some inspiration because, you know, all these artists, very high profile artists that I met, they left something in me for sure. So, you know, that piece wouldn't be able to come if I didn't follow, you know, this path that I followed. This is the first part. Then the second part is uh, you said, oh, great, you know, you're saying very beautiful things, but you're a very privileged person. You live in a part of the world that is very privileged. You're in an industry now is booming. You were very early in the NFT trend. That's very, very true. It's very true. The important part, in my opinion, is this, is that uh, 
as a society, we acknowledge one thing that uh, um, there is enough resources for everyone if uh, we readjust a bit the incentives. I think that the blockchain shows us that uh, we don't need to passively give our data and information to you know, the likes of Facebook, Google and other and let them profit from that. We can take control and for the fact that we are producing data, it is probably the most valuable commodity right now. We actually, so for the, for the fact that I exist, I create value. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can resolve that uh, part by, um, you know, create incentive schemes and projects that really push for people uh, to provide their this community to be active in the community and be rewarded. So then they have at least, you know, a house to hit uh, and health insurance, healthcare insurance and things like that. And then it's on them like what they want to do, who they want to be. But it shouldn't be something about survival. It should be something about, uh, you know, going uh, from a place where you're already fine to basically more than that. And then uh, it's on you. Like if you want to buy a $30 million house or a super yacht and you want to, you know, work like crazy into something, go ahead. But maybe if you are an artist and a creator and you don't care about that component, you do something else, or maybe you might have to merge both, and that's fine as well. But the important thing is that at the moment, unfortunately, in a situation where the norm is uh, I need to sell my time uh, for money, most of the time for doing something that I don't really care about, uh, I think the society is massively underperforming. There is like a massive untapped potential of people that uh, they want to be something but you don't have the means maybe, right? Because you are in a position that you were born in the wrong side of the world or with, uh, you know, you were in the wrong context and you cannot do certain things. Uh, so I think the, I'm really hoping that the blockchain is able to liberate, you know, society from, uh, from that. And I think, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that uh, trends like AI, uh, robotics and others, uh, are basically pushing us in that direction because many of the works that uh, the majority of the population is doing, they won't be necessary anymore. Robots will be able to do them better. AI will be able to do them better. So those people, they won't need to, they won't need to work. It's not like uh, my opinion. It's basically a trend that is happening and we just you know, continue increasing. So we need to address that uh, as a society. And uh, you, know, you need to put people in front of themselves. And right now, I don't think the majority of people uh, are uh, had that, you know, conversation with their self in the mirror, looking at you know, themselves in the eyes, is more um, crafted, is more like um, artificially created with uh, you know, an educational system that tells you, you need to be a doctor, uh, whatever you want, like an engineer, this, and then you go to a certain trajectory and you represent this, but you're not truly yourself. Then of course, you know, you need still need doctors, engineers, and everything. It's not saying that uh, the doctor should be an artist, or it should be someone that, of course, studied and put the hours and everything there. But you will have these people, don't worry. And if you don't have them, you readjust the incentives to ensure that you attract more people into that field. So it's all part of this. To be honest, the only thing that I do is this, and the art is a, a mean to this end, to arrive at this society at some point. No, I, I love what you said, and I completely subscribe that because I think that is the it should be the aim of first of all people understanding the challenges that we're facing as society and civilization as well. Because all the civilizations in history, and we just look at history, that try to kind of highlight uh, the kind of the fake gods or the the the, the clay feet of some of the, the the dreams always fell apart. And I think as well, like you said this creativity and this hard work of creating value for me is the key element because i think there's no way we can actually do this so i think one one last question and sorry i have to ask this because you touched this um so if you look at platforms like axie infinity um they were actually trying to create a reward system ecosystem a bit of a metaverse um, that was kind of one of the first platforms they was trying to do but they were of course damaged by the the hacking of their platform but for us one of the things and studies i saw I don't know if you are familiar with this data, but is that for instance on Philippines and in emerging markets, this was starting to create a huge revenue streams. And of course they start in Vietnam and so yes. forth. Um, and of course they have funding by Anderson Orovid, say 16Z. So I think it, I would like to touch how do you see these platforms? Because I think definitely 
there's a lot of studies say that uh, we can create these re reward system platforms, which is partly what the tokens should be about as well. But so far, none of these platforms create any kind of really, I would say any kind of solution that can actually solve uh, a lot of the things that we are talking in this call. It's true, that's very true. And that's also why at the very beginning, I mentioned that uh, I don't like, you know, when the tokens are created and they don't really have very clear uh, uh, use case. Um, but, you know, it all goes through trial and errors. We need to, basically the society that I'm comfortable with is a situation where if uh, the group of interest is big enough, it might demand a certain coin. Because if you think about it, uh, how do countries work, right? There are a lot of people that they are aligned into something, which is basically I'm born in a certain place. So, you know, we are, a, we are family, we're all together. And uh, most of them, they have uh, their own, uh, you know, currency, okay? So if you have uh, certain groups that are very influential, very big, and they're doing certain things, of course, it makes sense to create an incentive schemes around those groups. And um, yeah, those groups are uh, yet to be created, maybe. You know, now we're still in the experimental phase. I'm not saying it's something that uh, will happen now, but uh, in general, for me, it's important uh, to always... Uh, strive towards a higher ideal whenever I do something, okay? And I think this is an idea that uh, it makes sense based on my research and um, what I feel inside me is something that uh, um, I'm happy to, you know, dedicate a life uh, towards because that's, to be honest, what, uh, what, what, what it means to me. Um, but you should be careful, of course, like we go through trial and errors and I'm always extremely skeptical from, as I mentioned, beginning, any kind of uh, uh, token uh, mechanics. But the moment, you know, there are, whenever I'm convinced, then, you know, I always very happy because it means that there is someone that managed to crack, to crack, you know, that, uh, that sees, or, or at least it gives me indication that is on the right, uh, on the right trajectory. But uh, yeah. else, no, it's, it's not uh, because it's always difficult, in my opinion, uh, when you live in the present to think that you are early into something because you have all the past, you know, behind you and you're like, okay, that was so old, you know, now is the modern time, you know, now is uh, the most uh, recent uh, stuff we have them in this instant. Uh, but I think you need to do the effort of uh, trying to look forward by many years and say, okay, given the trends that has been happening in the world, what does it not makes what does it make logical sense for the society to go in? And then uh, you need to look back from that point. I mean, <laughs> I'm completely with you. It's not easy though. I think I think there's uh, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, disturbance of the force before we can actually get this. But I think it's, it works. It passes through people like you uh, and the likes of us to be very very conscious that we need to act. Uh, and do things. So I think you're doing that. So good for sure. For sure. <laughs> um, so I, I will. I will. I think we'll. I probably will push for a, a live with a couple of personalities in the near future. But I want to thank you for this time. We're going to put all the links to this. Congratulations, first of all, because it's a great work. I'm. I'm thank going you. actually to see it probably next week. And uh, and I think everyone should see it both in the website and actually live if you are in London. But you can see it around the world, and I'm sure that Andreas will put it in on his Twitter and on Instagram and as well um, on the website. Andreas, thank you so much. It's very inspirational, but as well, I love what you're doing and the action that you're taking forward. And I hope you thank can make you a good luck. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Speak soon. Ciao. Cheers. Thank you.